Dr. Jain is a recipient of the Rose Educator of the uh, Year Award from Southern Society for Pediatric Research and the Most Distinguished Physician of the Year Award from the Association of American Physicians of Indian Origin, AAPA, in 2015. Dr. Jain is a 2019 recipient of the Pediatric Pioneer Award from Children's Healthcare of Atlanta. I have a big list. I'm not going to read any more of the awards that sir has received. In 2004, Dr. Jain received an executive MBA from Gozuta Business School at Emory University and was later appointed medical director of the Emory Children's Center. He continues to serve there. In 2007 and again in 2009, he was elected to the board of directors of Emory Healthcare, a leading healthcare organization in the US with $4 billion in operating budget. Uh, just now he told us that is the second largest health organization in US. Amazing, sir. In addition, he serves on the board of directors of the Children's Healthcare of Atlanta Ch Clinical Network, the Gazeta um, Business School Healthcare MBA program, and the Global Center for Medical Innovations at Georgia Institute of Technology. But we all know Dr. Jain in some other uh, uh, role as well. He is the editor in chief of the uh, North American clinics in peri perinatology and serves on the editorial boards of various reputed journals, the BMC Pediatric, Journal of Strix and Gynecology, Neonatology Reviews and the Emory Health, various organs. So that is how his name keeps on coming every month you take up a journal. He also serves as the faculty in chief for the Neonatology Boards Review Program and has been named to several indoor lectureships. Um, in 2014, he was elected scientific chairman of the International Neonatology Association and chaired its annual congress in 2016 and 2018. And he was elected president of the International Neonatology Association in 2019. Apart from his academic role, Dr. Jain is also known as a keen advocate of personal and institutional wellness. He, if you remember, towards the beginning of our series in 2020, he had given to a, a given a talk to us on coping with the strain that the COVID pandemic is, is uh, th th throwing at us. The first wave was throwing at us. He has been. He also has a keen interest in vipassana meditation. He is a golfer. He is a tennis player and what not. Professor Jain has two children and is married to Shabnam Jain, MD, a faculty member at Emory, whom he considers his singular pillar of strength for over 30 years. Friends, I don't want to stand between you and the legend. Let's hear from the horse's mouth itself. Over to you, Professor Lucky Jain. My goodness. Um... Thank you so much, Dr. Manoj. Um, you, you brought um, some tears into my eyes. And if I, if I sound like I'm, I'm choking, I'm, I'm always, um, I, I, I miss my, my mother, my uh, family, um, the, the connections. Uh, this is my office over here. And I wanted to, to show you all a, a picture of my, my mother who um, I lost in um, uh, towards the end of 2019, early um, before the COVID crisis came in. Um, she was my source of um, strength and the connection that I had uh, to, to India. And for the last three or four years, Manoj, before she passed away, um, I used to come to India five, six times a year. Um, I would take Friday off and I would just fly out um, from here, get there Saturday morning, and I would be with her until Sunday evening, and then I would fly back here and be at work on Monday afternoon. Wow. And I, yeah, I, I continued that for many years because every time I would speak with her, um, and she would always say the same thing, Beta to mere ko dekhne kab aega? So, and, and I used to say, Ma, I was there just last month. Um, and so um, thank you for allowing me to maintain this connection with my, with my homeland. 
Um, I want to thank all of you, um, particularly Dr. Manoj Varanatu, uh, his humility and his just uh, kind spirit um, has, um, um, has just warmed my heart. Uh, Dr. Ruchi Nanavati, I've known uh, her and Dr. Um, Akash Pandita, Dr. TV Ravi, and all of you office bearers, uh, my, my greetings to you from Atlanta. So um, the topic today is a little, it's a little complicated topic, and I want to make sure that we, we spend time thinking about lung development and lung anomalies, because quickly, generally, we're quick to jump to surfactant and, and high-frequency ventil ventilation. Are you, um, uh, Manoj, are you able to listen, hear me okay? Yes, sir. Audio is perfect, sir. Please go ahead. Okay. So, um, so often we are quick to jump on to um, interventions without truly understanding how the lung develops. And, and much of my early research was around just looking at the basics of lung physiology, which is what I will share with you today. So we'll review the process of fetal and neonatal lung development with a particular focus on stages of development and structural changes in, in the lungs, and then review developmental abnormalities of the lung and their clinical course. Um, it's important to remember that lungs need a very large surface area for gas exchange. And that requires a thin alveolar membrane to allow for gas to pass from the alveolar space into the capillaries. But we breathe air in a very polluted environment. We inhale dust particles, we inhale bacteria. Um, and so the body has to have a mechanism to clean the lungs. Otherwise, over the years, our lungs would get completely um, chock full of, um, of, of pollutants. And so, Mother Nature has given us an aqueous barrier, a fluid barrier which lines the surface of alveoli. Now, anytime you have air and water coming together, that creates surface tension. That is the fundamental physical property or characteristic of an air fluid interface. And that surface tension needs to be addressed um, when we deal with surfactant um, and, and, um, and RDS. And then it is important to remember that breathing is simply moving of a gas in and out, but respiration involves exchange uh, of oxygen and carbon dioxide with the capillary network. Now, a question that is often asked is, at which stage of lung development is the lung considered viable? Um, and I'll talk, to, talk through uh, this question. Fundamentally, if you look at how the lungs develop by canalicular stage, end of canalicular stage, we begin to have um, sufficient amount of uh, saccular um, air spaces that allow for gas exchange, but not sufficient that um, the, the true alveolar growth starts close to term gestation and continues uh, well into our early years of life. And, and that is something that neonatologists and pulmonologists have only recently figured out. Um, we also often ask questions like this, why, why are there five lung lobes, not six, given that there are three lobes on the right side, why are there only two lobes on the left side? And we need to um, understand why that is so over with the development. So this picture shows you um, that many a times when we label babies as stillborn or early neonatal death and we don't have an autopsy or histopathology of the lung, we have no idea what happened to the baby. We assume that it was birth asphyxia, but really underlying uh, that, uh, that death of the newborn, there could be um, a variety of conditions. Now, just this morning, right before um, Manoj um, and I connected, um, we had grand rounds this morning from the American Academy of Pediatrics talking about global health. And 
there are still 1 million stillbirths across the globe. 1 million stillbirths across the globe. And we can have outstanding programs like neonatal resuscitation program, helping babies breathe, and other programs that have, have come into being. But if, unless we know that there are um, th there are abnormalities in the anatomy and physiology of the baby, we won't be able to tackle uh, the large number of deaths that happen each year. So uh, from an embryologic standpoint, the lung bud formation um, happens um, through an offshoot from the esophagus. And, uh, <clears throat> and, and in the pseudoglandular stage, all the lung is doing is branching. Each part of the airway divides into two, and those two divide into four, and those four divide into 16. And so um, we, we go on branching our airway until we get to about 24 branches. Imagine a tree which starts with a trunk and then um, continues to have two branches and then continues to grow uh, until uh, you get to 24 branches. And then at that point, our genetic makeup calls for the uh, branching to stop. And we start building secular uh, expansion of air spaces. And then as you see toward the right of your screen, Alveolar uh, growth starts around 36 weeks gestation uh, and birth. And we are starting to make septa, um, septation between the alveolar wall uh, to increase gas exchange. Because every time you create a membrane with um, capillary network around it, we are increasing the surface area. And that is what is shown uh, on the right side. So. Um, Progressive elongation and dichotomous branching from the proximal airway is critical. There is simultaneous uh, pulmonary vascular development from the sixth aortic arch, and this coincides with development of the kidneys. And so if you remember um, why uh, lung development is so connected with the kidneys, these two are happening simultaneously. If there is agenesis of kidneys, the lungs um, are poorly developed partly because of, uh, of this stage of development, but partly because oligohydramnios will ultimately lead to lung hypoplasia. Um, the, uh, the trachea and segmental bronchi are there, um, are all segmental bronchi are there by seven weeks. There is closure of the pleuroperitoneal folds at seven weeks, resulting in separation of the chest and the abdominal cavity. And this is important because failure to close this uh, pleuroperitoneal um, um, gap will result in diaphragmatic hernia. Um, and so diaphragmatic uh, defects um, are, um, um, are visible uh, on an ultrasound, uh, on a detailed ultrasound um, early on, uh, these contents return to the abdomen at about 10 weeks, um, um, resulting in, as I mentioned, um, uh, diaphragmatic hernia. Um, there is, um, in canalicular phase, um, there is development of rudimentary gas exchange units. And as I mentioned, branching of distal air spaces continues with a total of 23 to 24 um, uh, branches. In the saccular phase, um, gas exchange is enabled by alveolar capillary membrane formation. Uh, we continue to expand surface area by enhancing um, the septation, and there is a double net capillary network at this stage. Uh, in the alveolar phase, a true alveoli begin to appear at around 36 weeks gestation, um, and postnatal alveolar growth continues for one to two years. So this is a lot of lung development, and I don't expect everyone to remember um, any or all of this, but I think this is foundational. 
in some ways that we should be able to go back to this information. Um, and uh, Manoj, I would be delighted to share these slides with any and all of the NNF members so that if they want to teach their students uh, and, and residents, um, they can use this entire lecture um, to continue this conversation. Uh, but there is microvascular maturation in the double capillary network that we saw in the last slide um, in the vascular phase becomes a single capillary bed. And that is foundational because alveolar capillary dysplasia is a failure to create a single capillary bed. Now, late alveolarization continues between two and 20 years of age. We thought, just like with the brain development, we thought that brain cells don't regenerate and uh, lung cells don't really do much, but we now know that alveolar formation continues for a fairly long time. <clears throat> and that is why um, it is important that we not use <clears throat> high doses of corticosteroids and things that delay or slow down alveolar uh, formation. And I'll share with you a few things that um, modify lung development. Um, there are many factors that have been identified, some in my lab, that, um, uh, that modify lung development. Let me give you one example. I don't want to go through all of these, but uh, fibroblast growth factor <clears throat> 10 is one of the most upstream um, regulators of primary branching. If in an animal model you knock out FGF10, then the entire lung stops growing. All you see is a trachea and then nothing beyond that. The branching completely stops. And that's how we have been able to figure out what manages or what controls lung development. And um, what you'll see is that the mesenchyme around um, the lung is equally important as are three physical factors. The first physical factor which helps with, with lung growth is lung fluid because lung fluid expands the lungs. Um, and that stretch is a signal for um, the genetic signals to continue to do, let the lung grow. Um, we know this because if early on you start draining lung fluid, um, either as part of oligohydramnios with renal agenesis or through uh, premature rupture of membranes at any point, um, then lung fluid gets drained out and the lungs start becoming hypoplastic. Along with this, um, there are fetal breathing movements um, and peristaltic airway contractions that also put pressure on distal buds and help them grow. Um, we do know that vitamin A deprivation in pregnancy leads to tracheal stenosis, uh, and lung undergrowth or pulmonary agenesis if it's extreme. And yet, majority of obstetricians and neonatologists across the globe don't pay attention to the fact that vitamin A um, is required during pregnancy, and many mothers are, uh, are deficient in that. We do fortunately give mothers folic acid now, but one of the basic things that we can do um, with to our mothers when they come to us uh, with their babies, newborn babies and or older children is ask them if they're taking a multivitamin and get them into a habit of taking a multivitamin with good doses of uh, amount of vitamin A, vitamin D and, and folic acid throughout their life. Because um, in India, as in many other countries, you never know when, when a woman becomes pregnant and timing prenatal vitamins to the exact uh, pregnancy is extremely hard. By the time um, you've gone through eight weeks of gestation when the mother comes to know she's pregnant. Um, many of these malformations are already done, as I told you. Pulmonary agenesis happens between four and seven weeks gestation. How many mothers know that they are pregnant at four weeks of gestation? Um, also important are glucocorticoids, cyclic AMP, thyroid hormones, retinoic acid in lung development. Um, and maybe when we, uh, if we, uh, have an opportunity to do this again, um, I will be delighted to talk through some of the uh, mechanisms that are important in, in, um, in, in lung, uh, in healthy lung maturation. 
factors that interfere with alveolarization, um, mechanical ventilation of preterm lungs is a major factor because what it does is as the septae are forming, um, high pressure leads to disruption of these septae. And so what you're left with are large sacs without that intricate internal uh, and uh, uh, surface area uh, configuration that improves gas exchange. Um, inflammatory cytokines like TGF alpha, TNF alpha, hyperoxia and hypoxia, poor nutrition are all factors uh, that delay uh, alveolarization. Now lung maturation is not complete without pulmonary vasculature uh, coming through from the sixth aortic arch um, in, in um, airways, arteries, and veins uh, are developed in the adult pattern by the end of pseudoglandular stage. So there is some disruption uh, in this vascular um, uh, outgrowth from sixth aortic arch. Most of these babies get aborted uh, or, or they're ultimately born, stillborn. When you look at abnormal morphologic development, very early on in gestation, by about three to seven weeks gestation, lung atresia, um, laryngeal, um, esophageal, tracheal atresias, bronchogenic cysts, TE fistula, um, pulmonary sequestration uh, have already uh, occurred. In pseudoglandular stage, by 17 weeks of gestation, renal genesis, if there's there, it will lead to severe pulmonary hypoplasia. CCAM or CPAM uh, also occurs during this time, as does pulmonary lymphangiectasia, congenital uh, diaphragmatic hernia, and tracheomalacia or bronchomalacia. So lots of abnormalities have already occurred by 17 weeks of gestation. Later in lung development, uh, in the canalicular, saccular, and alveolar stages, you see other abnormalities appear uh, including alveolar capillary dysplasia, surfactant deficiency, and pulmonary hypertension. So let's talk about a few of these pulmonary malformations so we uh, get a better sense of how we can assist our surgical colleagues uh, and pulmonologists in managing these. Tracheoesophageal fistula occurs in about one in 2,500 births, which means an average Maternity hospital uh, in India with about 2,000 deliveries will see one baby with TE fistula at least once a year. Um, we know that um, it occurs more in male babies. And by seven weeks of gestation, it has already occurred. And it's because of incomplete fusion of the tracheoesophageal fold. Because remember, the trachea and esophagus are coming out of the same um, uh, tube that um, uh, from an embryologic standpoint. Um, these abnormalities often occur in clusters and you know that Vajra syndrome or bacterial syndrome includes vertebral anomalies, anal atresia and many other uh, abnormalities listed uh, uh, in, in classic textbooks. The TE fistula that is most common is uh, on the left side of the slide, you see esophageal atresia with distal tracheoesophageal fistula. And that occurs in about 87 to 90% of all TE fistula babies. The one that I have circled in the middle is an isolated TE fistula where there is no atresia. And generally these babies will present with recurrent pneumonia, um, in their early or late infancy and often are extremely hard to diagnose because most people don't think about an H-type fistula. And generally, uh, some of these babies develop at some point severe aspiration and pneumonia and die. Uh, the clinical correlates are extremely important to understand. Um, what is the cause of polyhydramnia? I was talking to uh, uh, Dr. Um, Manoj uh, about audience response questions. And I initially thought that we could go through a few of these uh, audience response questions, but then I realized with several hundred people trying to, um, mm, to, to coordinate this would, would be really hard, uh, but perhaps um, when I'm there with you in person, 
uh, I've been doing uh, for all neonatal um, board reviews, I've been doing um, uh, real life sessions where we go through calculations and we go through uh, gas exchange formulas and, and, and figure out how to calculate uh, various lung parameters. And, and that might be a time when we, we go through this. But what is the cause of polyhydramnios in TE fistula? Well, um, the, the fetus is swallowing a lot of fluid every day, over 100 milliliters per kilo per day. Um, and if the, if the esophagus uh, is not pated, then the baby is not able to swallow that fluid. <clears throat> and that leads to polyhydramnios. How do we know uh, if there is esophageal atresia before birth? Well, by looking for polyhydramnios after birth, we look for lack of gas in the stomach. If there's no stomach bubble, most likely there is esophageal atresia. Um, how do we know that an infant with esophageal atresia has a fistula? Um, well, that is interesting because as I'll show you in the x-ray um, in a minute, um, if there is esophageal atresia, there should be no gas in the stomach. But if there is gas in the stomach and you cannot pass a nasogastric tube, that means there has to be a tracheoesophageal fistula. Now, what happens when you put an infant with TE fistula um, and esophageal atresia on positive pressure ventilation? That is a, a real problem. We don't often think about this because when we put these babies on positive pressure ventilation, even with um, an Ambu bag, the pressure that we are putting into the trachea and the lungs, that same pressure is being communicated through the fistula into the stomach, and so the stomach gets distended. And when the stomach gets distended, the intestines get dis distended, and that air stays, stays trapped in the abdomen for a very long time, impeding gas exchange. But more importantly, uh, if we don't intervene, sometimes you can see perforation of the stomach. Um, and um, a question that often appears on the American board uh, is what happens when you have a TE fistula with an imperforate anus in a preterm infant with RDS? Well, um, that is a really one of the worst type of combinations that you will ever be asked to manage because the gas that is trapped in the stomach and intestines now cannot go out of the abdomen because of imperforate anus. Um, this x-ray shows you um, a, a baby with the RDS, you have an endotracheal tube, um, but the um, nasogastric tube, which you cannot see very well, is curled up in the esophagus. And yet you see there is gas in the stomach which and gas, lots of gas in the uh, intestines, which means that there is a TE fistula and the only way to fix this problem is to put in a, gastro, uh, in a gastrostomy tube. And that often has to be done as an emergent procedure because uh, if you don't, then at some point this baby will have a perforation. Bronchopulmonary sequestration is a mass of uh, abnormal pulmonary tissue, which is not connected to the tracheobronchial tree and it gets its blood supply from the aorta. Now, <laughs> There, there, there are board exams where people ask, does bronchopulmonary sequestration participate in gas exchange? And if I see a, a resident or a fellow struggle with this question, I'm wondering what have we done in, in training our people? If they don't understand that if a mass of lung tissue is not connected to the airway and gets its blood supply from the aorta, how can it participate in gas exchange? And so that's, I, I think, um, a, a fundamental issue with how we approach clinical medicine in, in that we don't um, ask ourselves um, the, the, these basic questions. Uh, and so our, our postgraduates and residents also um, are not uh, privy to this knowledge. Uh, the sequestration can be intralobular and extralobular, um, and really, um, you you just need to uh, be aware of, of the fact that sequestration 
uh, if it is a large sequestration, it will appear as a space occupying lesion in the lung. The bronchogenic cysts, on the other hand, um, are abnormal budding and branching um, uh, caused by abnormal budding uh, from the tracheobronchial tree, mostly found in the mediastinal area. Sometimes they'll have a check valve uh, type of connection so that when we breathe in, the cyst gets bigger, but then there is no way to decompress the cyst. Um, and, and if the cyst becomes uh, too large, it can uh, cause cardiovascular compromise and death. And uh, this X-ray um, and CT scan shows a large cyst over here um, on the right side in the lower lobe. Um, and, um, and, and you see that in the uh, CT scans as well. Congenital lobar emphysema can be regional or segmental, um, <clears throat> usually in the upper and middle lobe of the lung. Um, and it, it also can cause compression symptoms um, that you must be, you, you should be aware of. Often the diagnosis can be readily made uh, with a uh, CT scan. Now, if you look at congenital malformations of the lung parenchyma, there are many. Um, I, I'm go not going to be able to talk through all of those, but I just wanted to give you a flavor of a few of these. Pulmonary agenesis um, occurs in the embryonic stage of lung development, and there is complete absence of one or both lungs. If both lungs are absent, you have a stillbirth. If there's one lung absent, then sometimes, depending on how much hypertrophy has occurred on the other side, uh, many of these babies are normal at birth, and this becomes detected uh, only sometimes later in life when they have a pneumonia and you get an x-ray. And this is an example of a baby with pulmonary agenesis. You see on the right-hand side um, a, a white mass over here, which is just fluid that is occupied. But you also see a very hypertrophied uh, left lung over here. Um, the heart has moved over uh, to this side. Uh, and you see on a CT scan, uh, beautiful um, tracheobronchial tree um, um, branches on um, the left side, uh, but practically nothing except for this little uh, nubbin on the, on the other side. Lung hypoplasia can occur during any stage <clears throat> of lung development. I think it's important to remember uh, that many things that we do will further um, lung hypoplasia. I remember um, during my early years um, as a neonatologist, obstetricians had started using endomethacin to, um, uh, to treat preterm labor. And we used to see a lot of oligohydramnios and many of these babies had mild lung hypoplasia. Um, it's, it's critical that we review maternal history for uh, use of Motrin and, and other drugs that can uh, lead to those types of, of problems. Lung hypoplasia can be measured either by looking at lung to body weight ratio or lung DNA content. Um, and um, generally, if the lung volume is less than two thirds of normal lung volume, we call it lung hypoplasia. Lots of factors listed over here that um, you all know of. I mean, I'm always amazed by um, how um, our, our, my Indian colleagues everywhere in the world, their, their ability to retain um, knowledge and, and uh, memorize um, these types of um, lists is, is unbelievable. The, the um, mechanism is generally because of mechanical compression uh, of, the, uh, of the lungs, growing lungs. Earlier, the onset worse the compression, therefore worse the outcome. And this is often associated with severe pulmonary hypertension as well. Um, this is the most severe form of lung hypoplasia that you'll see in, um, in renal agenesis, where the baby has very flat uh, compressed facial profile um, limb deformities because there was no space in the uterus to grow and, um, and the um, uh, kidneys will be absent. There will be no urine uh, at birth. And when you do an ultrasound of the abdomen, you find no kidneys. A chest x-ray will reveal a bell-shaped chest 
Uh, and uh, often when you try to ventilate these babies, their lungs um, pop off very easily and you have a pneumothorax. In this particular baby, you see chest tubes on both sides. Congenital cystic lesions are common and poorly understood. Um, a, a bronchiolar or alveolar cyst uh, communicates with the proximal branches of the bronchiolar tree. Um, they can be fluid filled or empty or partially filled. Um, and it's just one of those things that you can uh, use your help, uh, help of your radiologist to identify. Here's a beautiful example of a congenital cyst of the lung with some fluid uh, in the cyst. And you see how strikingly different the cyst is from the rest of the lung. Cystic adenoid malformation or CPAM is a very common lung lesion, but very rarely diagnosed unless it's large. There are five types. Uh, type one is most common. It's frequently diagnosed on prenatal ultrasound. Um, and um, um, the word of caution that it may be confused with diaphragmatic hernia, small CCAMs generally present with recurrent infections, uh, but larger ones you'll see um, in the first week of life with, um, uh, with uh, abnormal blood gases. Um, this is an X-ray showing uh, a CPAM um, with um, uh, connections to the tracheobronchial tree and pulmonary branches as well. Yesterday, um, Manoj, I gave um, a similar talk to the, to the Saudi Arabian um, Society for Pediatricians and Neonatologists. There were 800 people um, in that conference yesterday. And one of the neonatologists asked me why some babies with CPAM uh, appear to have normal blood gases and don't uh, become symptomatic, are not symptomatic at birth. And the reason is that depending on how much uh, space they occupy, because they are connected to the tracheobronchial tree and have pulmonary blood supply, they can contribute to gas exchange. Alveolar capillary dysplasia is a rare fatal disorder. Um, there's inadequate vascularization of the alveolar parenchyma resulting in fewer calories, uh, capillaries in the alveolar wall. Um, there is often uh, pulmonary veins are misaligned. Uh, babies present very early on with pulmonary hypertension and that is often severe pulmonary hypertension. There's no response to surfactant nitric oxide, or any of the other things that we give to these babies. Uh, diagnosis is usually made at autopsy uh, or occasionally by lung biopsy um, if you're able to do one. And there is failure of fusion of the capillaries, the double capillary network, um, and mm, that needs to eventually become a single capillary network. And, and that failure uh, is al alveolar capillary dysplasia. Uh, congenital lymphangiectasis is extremely rare. I've listed it here so that you can uh, look at it. It occurs often with Noonan syndrome, sometimes with Down syndrome. Um, and what you'll see is high number of lymphocytes in the, um, um, in the fluid that you, um, you, you take off uh, from uh, the um, spaces around the lungs. Uh, secondarily, it may be associated with congenital heart disease, and some of those lesions are listed here. Finally, um, congenital diaphragmatic hernia is a lesion that most of you are very familiar with. It occurs in one to 2,000 to one in 4,000 births. 85% uh, are on the left side, and only 1% are bilateral. Um, the defects could be either posterior lateral or central, um, almost half of the babies have multiple anomalies <clears throat> and almost every single one of them uh, has pulmonary, uh, accompanying pulmonary hypoplasia and pulmonary hypertension. Now the earlier the onset of diaphragmatic hernia, greater the degree of lung hypoplasia. And as you know, that um, fetal surgeons in the US and many other countries have tried to reduce the diaphragmatic hernia in utero to see if lung growth can be promoted. And people have also tried 
um, experiments where if you um, if you um, block the airway on the side that is developing diaphragmatic hernia, you expect the lung to grow uh, on that side, pushing the bowel down back into the abdomen. But um, uh, there is no clear evidence that those uh, procedures improve outcome. <clears throat> For assessment of severity, um, we look at the lung um, head circumference ratio, the lung chest transverse diameter ratio, um, looking for liver in the chest, um, assessment of lung volume by MRI or ultrasound, um, size of pulmonary artery. I have occasionally gotten consults from, um, from well-informed parents in India um, where in the more uh, better equipped centers in the country, uh, they have uh, made these diagnoses early on and they ask whether or not bringing their, um, uh, you know, delivering the baby in, in Europe or uh, in, in the US might improve uh, outcome given that we, um, we may be doing uh, more ECMO, et cetera. I do think that there is a need to develop uh, centers of excellence in India, where we start doing larger number of uh, or manage um, more diaphragmatic hernias in single centers in cities like Bombay, Mumbai, Delhi, Chennai, and other areas. And that's the only way to do it. We're the only ECMO center in this entire region. And uh, all diaphragmatic hernias come to my hospital. And that allows for the team to be extremely sophisticated in approaching these babies. Um, so why are there five lobes in the lung, not six? Uh, well, because um, there is heart on this side um, and over, um, over the thousands and thousands and thousands of years of development, um, genetic changes have occurred, which allow for only two lobes to mature and develop over here. Uh, rather than three lobes over here. Uh, I wanted to leave a few minutes for questions and answers. Um, I know we went through this fairly fast. Um, Dr. Varanatu had given me 40 minutes and I'm exactly at, uh, at 40 minutes uh, of this conversation. Um, I do think that we have come a long way in our ability to take care uh, of babies um, and, and the, the promise that we make to every mother who brings um, her pregnancy to us or her newborn baby to us, the, the promise that we make to them is that um, we will do everything possible um, in our power to help improve the outcome. Um, I, I, I mentioned to you all that I had some health issues many years ago and when I was in the ICU, um, I always um, remember there was one physician who would come to the, um, to the hospital room. And as the person spoke to me, um, he would always hold my hand. And during that time, the only thing that I remembered was that warmth of the hand and the kind spirit that accompanied that, that warmth. Um, it didn't matter to me whether they were telling me about dopamine or this or that, you know, I mean, that's their business. I'm there as a patient. I don't really need to know every single detail, but what I really need to, to know or be reassured is the person who's taking care of me has my, um, my health in their hands. And, and that is what I feel we need to do um, as a collective organization, uh, continue to create um, that knowledge, skill set, and the desire to do good. Thank you so much, um, all of you, and I'm happy to take questions. 
thank you so much sir that was uh, b uh, highly uh, 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 inno innovative way and uh, you have presented a not so interesting topic and we all were glued to our seats uh, hearing each and every aspect thank you so much amazing talk as usual i would take the liberty of uh, 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 taking three, three exactly three minutes from all of you to uh, just invite you to the upcoming uh, grand final of the uh, uh, learn from the legend series so uh, it is my uh, privilege to um, invite you all for this uh, grand uh, uh, conference which we are hosting in the last weekend of may <laughs> thank you everyone may I now request uh, the moderators of today's session dr ruchi nanavadi and dr agash pandita to kindly take over for the panel discussion thank you thank you manoj um thank you very much dr jain it's indeed a huge honor for all of us that you are here to talk to us and it's actually dream coming true for most of us present here so i expect lot of questions and let me start with the first uh, first question and the first question is by dr sunita that how much does childhood asthma affect alveolar development and how do the breathing exercise help it if at all oh that's an excellent question i think that uh we it it's a chicken and egg situation where if if in childhood asthma um which is not properly managed we continue to do use high high doses of corticosteroids which is the normal treatment nowadays for asthma that will lead to reduction in alveolar uh, growth 
And so that adds to the um, severity of future asthma attacks uh, if it happens over and over and over again. So um, as much of preventive work we can do, uh, early diagnosis, uh, getting uh, parents to understand what triggers asthma attacks, that's all important. Um, it's important also to give parents hope that lungs continue to grow. And as the severity of asthma goes down with age, um, some of these uh, uh, children will recover completely. Okay. Uh, another interesting question is from Dr. Bharat Raturi. He wants to know whether does smoking, diabetes, etc. during pregnancy affects lung maturation, especially alveolarization? And uh, what is the role of pollution? Can it, can it have a criminative sort of factor for the same uh, development of the lung? Yeah, uh, Dr. Raturi, sir, it's a pleasure to hear from you. Um, diabetes, as you all know, uh, increases insulin um, levels in the fetus. Maternal diabetes increases uh, fetal insulin levels, and that leads to uh, slowing down of fetal lung development. Uh, particularly, you know that uh, surfactant deficiency is more common in infants of diabetic mothers, it also leads to abnormal cardiovascular development. Um, and so both of these factors overall impact lung development in diabetic mothers. Smoking um, has a greater impact on overall fetal growth, um, but not as much of a direct effect on lung development. Uh, another question is, uh, you know, from Dr. Kumar Gaurav related to the management. So uh, Dr. Kumar wants to know that, sir, in your experience, please share the ventilator management of CPAM. And uh, because the CCAM babies are very difficult to diagnose, so what to anticipate while managing such infants? Right. So uh, Dr. Gaurav, it, the management of CPAM uh, generally is is um, based on classic standards. You, there's nothing special that we do over here. Um, the idea is to use minimal uh, pressure settings uh, if possible. And a lot of us have now begun managing these babies with the non-invasive ventilation, which allows for um, least amount of expansion of the, of the tissue. Um, if one can avoid that, generally, uh, these babies, um, the ones with smaller CPAMs um, are, are okay. With the larger CPAMs, surgical resection is often needed. Okay. Thank you, sir. I hand over now to my colleague, Dr. Akash. Akash, are you there? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, first of all, uh, a hearty congratulations to Team Neocon. And uh, in fact, uh, I would uh, not hesitate to sit at uh, having lucky gents sir, with us Today, we all are lucky and uh, we all have been listening to you. And in fact, I have grown up as a neonatologist reading your books. And But the first thing I used to see in clinics was your picture. Because just like we take inspiration from our God as our culture, I used to look at your picture for five, six minutes so that I can imbibe those positive vibes. So having sharing screen space with you is in that one of the highs of my career, sir. Thank you so much. For your lecture, Thank it was you, really Akash. Cool. Thank you very much. That is very kind of you. Um, and I, Chris, I feel, I feel so inspired by by the words that you all say. I feel I'm not worthy of any of this, but I, I really appreciate the uh, uh, the the feelings. Thank you very much, uh, sir. Uh, we all talk about the role of antenatal corticosteroids for lung development in antenatal period, but what is the effect of postnatal steroids when used early in neonatal life, sir? Is it the same or is it the other side? Right, so uh, that's a really important question, um, Akash. The appropriate use of antenatal steroids now uh, all the way up to about 36 weeks gestation actually helps lung development in, in some ways because uh, if delivery happens soon after the dose of um, uh, steroids is given, then the exposure to the steroid is short-lived. So think about this. If we give steroids to a mother 
um, at 22 weeks gestation or 24 weeks gestation, and she doesn't deliver until 34 weeks of gestation, then the fetus has been exposed to this high dose of steroid for 10 weeks because the baby is recirculating the steroid. There's no way for beta methasone to get out of the fetal circulation. It keeps peeing it out and then reabsorbing it. And, and that leads to prolonged exposure to steroids. And that leads to some degree of lung um, uh, arrest of lung development. Postnatally though, when we give very high doses of dexamethasone, prednisone, or other steroids to babies who we think are developing um, bronchopulmonary dysplasia, that has been shown to arrest lung development. And as such, as you know, BPD is a disease of arrested lung development. So we're really, really making it, it worse. Um, what I generally do is make sure if I need to use steroids, I use it to get the baby off the ventilator and then wean them, wean them off. Thank you so much sir, for that uh, clarification. And uh, the second question is from Dr. Rohit. Uh, that uh, depending on the gestation, we know that uh, the lung goes through various stages of development. So an RDS in a 24 weeker, is it similar to an RDS seen in more mature baby at 30 to 32 weeks? I'm sorry, I didn't understand this question. So the next question is from Dr. Rohit. He wants to ask that depending on the gestational age of the neonate, is the outcome of RDS different? Because the lungs will be at different stages of development for a 24-weeker versus a baby who is 30 to 32-weeker. Oh, of course, yes. Yeah. So in a 34-weeker, in a when they develop RDS, that is pure surfactant deficiency. You give surfactant, you, you treat the RDS, and you should see very good response. And that is why minimally invasive surfactant use is so effective in these situations, because you can get away without ever needing to intubate these babies, and you put them on a little bit of CPAP, next day they are off oxygen completely. Whereas at 24, 26, 28 weeks gestation, the lung is simply not mature. And so, RDS is only one component of the picture that you're seeing. There's not just enough area for gas exchange, and that is why you need a combination of, of uh, treatment plans to make sure that you allow the baby enough time uh, for lung growth to occur. Uh, thank you again, sir. Uh, next question for the sake of our... Resident, sir, when should one lung malformation can be one of the causes of the presentation? Lung what? Sir, when should one think that uh, lung malformation can be the cause of underlying respiratory distress in a newborn? Oh, yeah. So, uh, you know, generally, Akash, the, the first thing we do when there's a baby, newborn baby with respiratory distress is, is get a chest x-ray. And I think that... Um, it's important to, in the digital frame that we get, to magnify the lung um, and re review it with the radiologist to see what, what is the disease that we're trying to treat. I've seen people uh, using surfactant in babies who have black lungs. And I'm thinking, my God, I mean, this is not surfactant deficiency. This is pulmonary hypertension. Why are you putting surfactant into the lungs? And so, I think a, a close inspection of the x-ray will give you the first clue that there might be a lung malformation, but generally you need a CT scan to confirm it. Uh, often uh, we found it difficult to ventilate babies with CDH. Sir. What is the strategy you apply in your unit to ventilate babies with CDH? And is there any role of surfactant in such babies? Yeah, oh, that, that is a discussion for another hour, uh, Akash. Um, I think the most important thing is you put a nasogastric tube in the delivery room uh, that you use the least amount of pressure early on so that you don't inflate the stomach and the, and the gut. Um, and uh, we, um, our strategy is to tolerate a little bit of hypercarbia, uh, lower oxygen saturations, um, and, and try and get away without traumatizing the lungs too much. 
that's where the bigger problem occurs when you have secondary damage. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, uh, that is in my personal experience, we have seen that uh, babies who are with RH isomerization, they have a lot of high incidence of RDS. Is there any role of fetal anemia on lung development or surfactant developments? Uh, say that question again, I'm sorry. So in our uh, own center, we see a lot of RH isomerized mothers. Yeah, RH isomerization, yes. Uh -huh. Is there any role of fetal anemia or RH isomerization on fetal lung development? Because most of these babies present with respiratory distress, even if they are late preterm or more correct, mature. Correct. Yeah. So if there is, there is NSARCA, you know, that's that will impede lung development, but otherwise I am not, I'm not sure, Akash, if there is any direct impact on lung development per se, because lung development is genetically programmed and you normally wouldn't expect, um, you know, mild degree of anemia um, to impact lung development. Akash, I am sorry, I have to go to another meeting and I did not realize that we um, um, you, we had to go beyond 10 o'clock. So um, if Thank you can make at the last question. Yeah, one, one yes. question. Yes, there the is last. one interesting question. Uh, this is that, um, uh, you know, uh, as far as the long-term uh, lung development is concerned, someone wants to know that when should we go ahead with pulmonary function test in extremely oh, yes, over yes. infants? Yeah, yeah. So that that I think it, it's an important thing to uh, keep in mind that early on lung function testing is not uh, easy to do, and, and um, most of what you gather from these babies is by looking at their oxygen saturation, their respiratory rate, um, and overall ability to um, to breathe without oxygen supplementation. Um, in babies that require prolonged oxygen supplementation, um, at some point when they when you're able to do some measurements, particularly of airway resistance, that is important um, because lung compliance doesn't really change much um, after a certain point. Surfactant becomes sufficient. It's mostly increased airway resistance. So thank you so much, everyone. And uh, we'll certainly continue this conversation on another day. I want to thank all of you uh, for attending the session. Thank you so much, sir. Well, let us hope that uh, by God's will, uh, you, uh, we would be able to continue the conversation may itself in case we are, uh, you are able to travel and then uh, join us for the conference. We okay. sincerely hope that you would be able to come, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank well, you. Well, I'll try my best. And apologies for keeping you late. Actually, we wanted to finish. I mean, it, uh, the session got a little prolonged. Ap apologies for that. And uh, no problem. Yes. Thank you. Thank you so, thank you much, so much. Really enjoyed the session. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank thank you, you so you, much. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Bye, Dr. Yes. Nanavati. Bye, um, Manoj, Akash. Thank you so much, sir. Bye. Thank you. Friends, I would like to also express our great uh, the, the gratitude to the moderators who manage the session. There are a lot of questions they manage. The essence of all the questions uh, in, in the short time we had. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Ruji Nanavati and Dr. Agash Pandita for moderating the session so well. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you, sir. You Thank you for having us. And always and a pleasure, sir. Thank you. And uh, before we close, let me all uh, let me again invite all of you. Uh,